Good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Beauty. We are so excited for today's live because we have got a special guest for you all. But we also have two very special co-hosts. We've got oh, Mo Makeup, Mo Beauty over here. And we've got hello, hello. the beautiful Vicky J. So Hi. if you're wondering why they're here with us, this is why. So it was Vicky J's idea to do a collaboration on Fumi palette book. And from that, we got the idea of bringing her on the show. So we have to thank Vicky J and Mo. If it wasn't for her idea, we wouldn't even have had this idea to invite Fumi Fato here. So thank you, Vicky J. Thank you, Mo, for joining us. Of course, I've got my amazing co-host, Kelsey Brianna J. Woo! Hey! Hey! <laughs> So we're, we're so excited to have you all. Thank you for joining us this morning. Kelsey, do you wanna just give us the rundown of this amazing guest that we have this morning? For sure. I definitely feel like we're on the Brady Bunch though. I do have to acknowledge <laughs> yes. that first. <laughs> Most <laughs> deaf. Yes. Hey. <laughs> so I am so excited this morning because we have the amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. and I, can I just say amazing one more time? Say it again. Say it again for the people. Oh, in amazing. Fumi. Phenomenal. Oh my gosh. So phenomenal. Fumi Pato. And she is just a titan in the industry. She is a contributing editor at The Observer Magazine. She is a beauty editor at the Vogue, she's, British Vogue. Vogue. Vogue, darling, Vogue. And she is the author of the book, Our Beauty Bible, the beauty Bible for women of color. And let us just take a moment and you know, let me just do <laughs> Friends, yes. oh, oh, yeah. drop this. <laughs> This Lovely. book right here is just a wealth of knowledge, and we have the Fumi Fato here on our show, oh. Behind the Beauty. So let's put put our hands together, and let's welcome her in. Oh, I love that picture so much, and thank Aww. you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank oh, you goodness. so much, and how are you? Okay. I'm pretty well. Um, I have just gotten back from holiday. I actually traveled, um, which was quite a strange, strange but wonderful experience. So right. I'm kind of back into the work mode now. But yes, I'm very, very well. The sun is shining and it's all good. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. We're doing well. Oh, Absolutely man. doing well. Yeah. So, yeah. Nice to you too. And your makeup and everything is so on point. All of you. you just thank look you. Oh, thank you. Amazing. Well, we have to thank you because thank you use so all much. the products in your oh, book today. Oh, yes, yeah, we do. You guys are the experts. You know, you're, you're amazing. <laughs> and we know you love a bold lip, so we coordinate it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're working it together. I love it. We could be a girl yes, band. Yes. 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 Let's just give the people just a quick so intro. Tell them a little bit. About yourself. For us, uh, so to speak. Uh, we have a really quick rapid fire for you. Um, okay. What are the five makeup products in your beauty bag currently? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> Pat McGrath Foundation. Uh -huh. Nas um, Foundation. The Radiant Longwear. Because I think yeah. a woman always needs more than one foundation. That's key. For sure. Um, gosh, what else is in there? I chop and change so much. Oh, the Gucci Mascara is pretty good. <gasps> We love Ooh, Gucci mascara. Yeah. 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 The mascara yeah. is good. And the, the bronzer is actually really good. But if you if, uh, you're, if you don't have sort of reddish undertones, you need to kind of go a little bit. Oh, you've got one. Oh, we I'm wearing it today. Where's my, where's my girl? It is beautiful. I just cannot put okay, her Okay, we are, we are a girl band. We are. Wait, we are band. Wait hold on. This is the real Come on now. Okay. I'm in the band. I'm loving this so much. I'm oh, loving this whole situation. Okay, this is major. All of us. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> it's good, right? It is it's amazing. Very, it's really good. I haven't put it down <laughs> since I purchased it. Yeah, it's so, yeah. so good. Um, and then I like a good highlighter. I love um, Gold Deposit by MAC. I still think it's oh. I still think it's amazing. I think it's amazing, especially when you use it slightly crumbled into your foundation. 
So, okay. so yes, yeah, off the top of my head. Yeah, and just actually, literally just crumble a tiny bit, not too much, but just a tiny bit and mix it in with your foundation. So it then gives you that sort of awake kind of look. It just lifts your your um your foundation. So I find that to be quite a good trick. And it lasts a oh. lifetime. But God help you to break your bag. Yeah. I've never yeah. tried that before. That sounds amazing. I will yeah, be doing that. It yeah, works. I've had my gold deposit since 2002. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can break a little bit. It'll be Vintage over there. Oh, friend. It oh, literally cool, but never it still works. works. Out. Yes. <laughs> I love what you give, you have such a beautiful glow. So any tips that you provide on a glow, I'm following. Because I oh, love you. So sweet. Thank you. Yes. That's so kind. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, those were just some off the top of my head. Yeah. Awesome. So, I am so here for it. I'm sorry, Chelsea, didn't mean to cut yeah, you no, off. No, no. All I was going to say is, is that we are so excited to have you here. And while I did a little bit of an introduction for you, before we get into our questions, would you mind giving the people a little bit more? Because, you know, sing your praises. You are just yeah, that exactly. woman. And I mean, yes. I'm blown away that you're here today with us. Thank you. I'm I'm really thrilled to be here, and I really mean that sincerely. It meant so much um, to come on here. You guys have been so incredibly supportive, and that means so much. So thank you. Um, so what can I tell you that you haven't already said? I'm from Beto. I am a contributing editor at Vogue, and I was an acting beauty director there also. I have a column at The Observer. I'm the beauty director there. And I have my book, Palette, The Beauty Bible for Women of Color. I've been in the industry probably for, I don't know, nearly 20 years or around that time. And I started out in fashion and slowly kind of wormed my way into beauty and started writing about both. And then I sort of started to focus more on beauty for, for a number of reasons, um, which I guess we'll probably get into when you ask me some questions um, yeah. later on. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> and I do a lot of consulting work for tons and tons of brands who, you know, ask me to do a lot of work for them. So I do a lot for lots of global brands. Yes. Amazing. I can kind of picture Fumi, um, tell me if I'm wrong here. I can picture you and Pat sitting down for tea and just chatting. Well, uh, funny you should say that. <laughs> We did just before the, the, you know, before Rona kind of hit, uh, we did in Paris for a little bit and we were meant to have sort of part two and it, you know, hasn't happened, but um, hopefully soon we'll meet again. But yes, yes. I love her. I, She's wonderful. I, I, um, I, I, I saw the picture <laughs> of like you wearing that gold <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and I'm like, I would try to take that too. That was I mean, like- I did. <laughs> And Pat, I was like, okay, bye, Pat. I'm going now. And she's like, yeah, thing on. And I was like, yeah, bye. And to be honest, I actually mm -hmm. forgot I had it on quite conveniently. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> I heard Pat is not, like, she does not let people take like, her good hair. On, uh, 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 <laughs> she wasn't playing with that hair back. <laughs> I don't blame her. So, so we'll get started we, with our questions. So our first question get, for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> So our first question for you is going to start with your experience at Vogue. So I'm a okay. huge Sex and the City fan. I have mm -hmm. all of the shows. Love mm -hmm. that show. Yeah. So when I think of Vogue, I think about the time where Carrie went to Vogue. And that's kind of what I have in my head. But tell us how it has been working there. What is your like day-to-day -day schedule like? And what is Vogue's beauty closet like? Okay. So a few questions in there. So... Vogue is um, not like people would sort of imagine. It's actually much more down to earth. Um, okay. People are much nicer, probably than people <laughs> in business. <laughs> much nicer, much more down to earth. It's much more fun, and um, okay. yeah, and it, it's 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 a lovely, lovely, lovely team and lovely team to work with on a day to day basis. You know. We'd probably do a lot more work than someone like Carrie would do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we don't sort of <laughs> bounce around in sort of lovely heels and lovely dresses. At some point, we actually have to get some work done. So, you right. know, we deal a lot with all the PRs for all the big brands. Um, every single day, you have millions of emails to get through. You're planning an issue um, 
print issue. You're also planning things for online. You're, you're commissioning out um, articles or even just coming up with ideas for shoots and ideas for what to cover in different issues or you know, having a look at what's going on in the world at the moment and how that's influencing beauty and how we can write about that, um, getting different writers on board. Then, of course, going to a lot of launches Right. which now is all digital, of course, because everything's changed now. So we're doing a lot of those launches digitally. And um, there was also a lot of travel, a lot mm -hmm. of travel. Okay. And um, of course, that's also kind of come to a standstill. So that's kind of changed and we're doing ev everything seems so much more digital now, but it's kind of enabled everyone to be so much more creative, I think, in many ways, because yeah. you're forced to, you know, you have no choice. So mm -hmm. yeah, on a day to day basis, that's basically what kind of happens and meetings in between and so on. Um, in terms of the closet, yeah, I mean, the closet is major, I won't lie. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And it's always it thrills me when, you know, we might have like a new intern start, and um, we open up the covers and it's always an audible gasp. It's always like, <gasps> <laughs> I know that would be me. Yeah, you forget because you see it all the time. So you don't sort of think too much about it. You just, you know, have another product comes in or you're looking for a product and you're looking through. But really it's like the ultimate kind of beauty walk-in closet. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's quite fabulous. <laughs> That's just a dream. I love it. I mean, in your roles that you have in general, I mean, in journalism, you do so many amazing things. For those of us who are interested in following in your footpaths mm -hmm. in journalism, mm -hmm. how would you instruct someone to go down that field and be able to work and do some of the things that even one of the things that you've accomplished. Mm -hmm. Bless you. Thank you. Um, so my role has changed now in terms of, uh, you know, my role at Vogue. So I'm no longer even really based in the office so much because I'm now a contributed editor. Um, but, but even so, I think that the format is, is, is very similar. I would say that if you want to get into journalism, I, I would say one of the key things is have a voice. You know, mm -hmm. when you're, you're um, writing or you're deciding that, okay, you want to be a journalist and you want to write about certain things and so on, I think it's so important to have a voice. You know, I have so many young writers, you know, get in touch with me and, you know, and show me their writing and so on. And what they're trying to do is mimic someone else. You mm. have to carve out your own voice. That is so, so important because you can only mimic someone else for so long. After a while, you need to stand on your own, you know, and you and that's what's going to give you longevity. I would say now, you know, back in the day, normally I would say try and get an internship and different, you know, publications and so on. But I think that's really changed. I would say start a platform yourself where you showcase your work and just start writing, just start writing. And then, you know, get in contact with maybe some of the, uh, you know, smaller um, websites, you know, smaller brands or whatever, where you can start doing some work for them and so on. Because I know it's difficult to suddenly kind of go from not having any published work at all and then suddenly trying to get something published in the New York Times. Right. You know, the, the possibility of that happening, you know, as much as I'm like, you know, touch the sky and go for it and so on. The reality right. is that it's it's quite difficult for someone who doesn't have any writing experience to suddenly yeah. get their work published in such a publication. So I would say start where you are, start, you know, launch your own um, site or blog and just start writing articles where people can see your work and so on and you're on your social media platform and just start creating almost like a brand for yourself. And then at the same time, start pitching ideas um, to different sort of platforms and different, you know, news organizations and magazines and so on. But try and make sure that you're not pitching ideas that are just the same ideas that mm -hmm. anyone will pitch and they're quite unimaginative. Always try to get a different slant on it, which is why I say to people, I say, well, read widely. You know, if you yeah. want to write about beauty, don't just read beauty publications, you know, read... I don't know, read The New Yorker, you know, read other publications, read, you know, read a lot of newspapers, um, read food magazines, you know, it's incredible and quite amazing where inspiration can come from. It can come from so many different places. Yeah. 
But if you only focus on being in one particular circle, um, right. your, your ideas become incredibly limited. But if you kind of broaden your mind, read fiction, you know, lots of different things can inform the kind of ideas that you have. So this is my advice that I, I always give to everyone that you must read widely. It will really kind of help to generate those ideas. Awesome. Could you give a few recommendations of some things that you're reading that you would like to share with us? Oh, um, <laughs> let's see. I like reading The Atlantic. Um, there's another magazine here um, that is part of The Economist, which is, um, it's called 1843. I don't know if you can get it over there. I think you might be able to get it over there. And uh -huh. they, they're nothing to do with beauty. Sometimes they'll have something slightly beauty related and they might have something fashion-y in there, but it is amazing how you just start to pick out certain trends or certain interesting things that you think, oh, that could tie in quite well into this piece right. I'm thinking about beauty, you know, because nothing functions in a silo. That's the thing. You know, we right. can talk about lipstick, but, you know, when you talk about lipstick, you can also look back at history and the history of lipstick and the way people used to wear it in the past and so on. It's not just the lipstick. There's so many other facets to it. So that's why I say, you know, read lots of different things. I mean, even, you know, fiction, you know, I love a lot of international fiction. I love sort of fiction that's based in Asia or based, you know, in Africa, because obviously my heritage, I, so I love someone like Chimamanda and Ngozi Adichie. I love everything that she writes. Um, yes. But also I love, um, you know, different cultures. I love reading Jewish, you know, Jewish fiction, for instance. Right. I find that fascinating. You know, just things where it just opens up your mind and you start to see things in a way that you wouldn't normally see. So I would recommend that. Just read everything as much as you can get your hands on, read it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Also, how did you transition from fashion, the fashion world into the beauty world? Nice. You know, it was, it was kind of accidental. I mean, even in terms of getting into fashion, I didn't study um, journalism. I didn't study fashion or beauty. I actually studied finance. So by the time I left uni, which I guess is college for you guys, yeah, um, yeah. by the time I left, yeah. university, I, um, I was part qualified as an accountant. And okay. then I worked for a few years um, within financial management and I didn't love it. I just, it just wasn't me, you know, and I always tell this story that when I was, um, there was a day when I kind of walked in to the office and I was wearing this sort of asymmetrical dress and sort of purple snakeskin cowboy boots and I and it was a very corporate office and I kind of thought hmm I don't think you're supposed to be here I just didn't fit in um, I think they all thought I was just crazy yeah so then I you know and so I just took the leap really you know I decided to um quit my job and at that point you know I was a single parent with a little kid and so on and but I quit my job and I decided that I wanted to go into magazines because I knew I always loved, I loved magazines and I loved mm -hmm. words, but I did, and I loved fashion. So I thought, well, it has all of those elements and I'll work out the rest, you know, once I get there. And while I was kind of, before I gave him my um, notice, I'd given, I'd given Al a call here in the UK. And I basically said, I'd love to come and do some work experience and so on an internship. And they offered me a six month internship. And that's basically how I made the leap. So I started doing that. I worked um, there for a little while. I went to a few newspapers. I worked at Harper's Bazaar and so on. And then um, when I left Harper's Bazaar, as I was a fashion writer then, when I left, I started freelancing quite a lot. And um, when you freelance, you turn your hands to so many different things. And I just started writing a little bit about beauty. and people started asking me to write more about beauty. And for me, I wanted to write about beauty in a way that wasn't just superficial because I think beauty is so much more than that. You know, it gives us confidence. Yeah. It connects us as women. I mean, there's so, so many right. things that um, beauty encompasses. It's not just about the thing. It's so much more. And I wanted to write about that. And I also felt that none of the beauty pages in any of the publications were speaking to me. I never right. saw a woman who looked like me. I never saw anyone with my hair texture, you know? So I think that was one of the things that made me feel, actually, I need to have a place in this. I need to have a voice 
within this because something needs to change because it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that was it basically. And that's how I kind of made the transition and just more and more, I started writing more about beauty. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. It really I mean, is. I would have never known that you didn't start out did wanna, oh, I'm sorry. in that career. I'm sorry, Vicky J, go ahead. And I just wanted to say that um, your book was mentioned to me by a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, you, the first part of the book where you were talking about your childhood and going to the mm -hmm. drugstore and just yes. seeing um, the same thing yeah. that I saw, um, mm -hmm. even though, yeah. um, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s, but I think mm -hmm. I, I was I was like a little one in the 90s. So I'm, mm -hmm. I want to more so say like the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, I was still having the same problem that you had. Yeah. I related yeah. so much to mm -hmm. everything that you mentioned about, you know, having to compromise so much yeah yeah I, completely um completely. and i got a bit discouraged honestly um mm -hmm. when it came to makeup and i just decided not to really wear it that much mm -hmm. until i got much older um mm -hmm. and now i feel like the tides are turning because we have this platform social media mm -hmm. to um really reach these brands and say you need to do xyz or, or like could yeah. you do xyz so that absolutely we, you know we exist exactly. <laughs> hi mm -hmm. yeah 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 like hey hi. yeah yeah, yeah. Totally. and, and yeah. i've seen mm -hmm. that tide change and then coming mm -hmm. across your book and relating so much to what you were talking about it just meant so much to me and that's why mm -hmm. i said I need to make sure everybody knows about this as many That's people as so I can kind. reach Thank to you. Um, let them all know about your book. So it has changed um, quite a quite a few people's lives, especially Thank my girl over Gosh. here. That her. means so much. Thank you. Yeah. You're very welcome. And I Thank want to you. expand more on what she was talking about. So in your book, you were talking about your biscuit moment. And yeah. That like I was like I can't imagine how you felt going mm -hmm. into the drugstore, mm -hmm. being there with your friends, and being mm -hmm. excited like we're gonna buy mm -hmm. some makeup. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Like, The deepest shade is biscuit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like nothing. Wrote, but... I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please, please go ahead. Yes. So you, 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 you wrote this statement that really, like, unfortunately, still applies today, and you said. Mm -hmm. At that moment, you felt like the beauty space was an exclusive private party. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you captured that so well and so perfectly because, yes, we are you're seeing that growth. We are seeing expansion. But in, there, in some spaces, we still can see that it's not inclusive. So do you still feel like as a whole, our beauty space is this exclusive beauty or private party, or do you feel like we really are breaking that point where we are starting to really be inclusive across the board? You know, I do think that things are changing. I've definitely seen some change. Um, you know, I still, as an editor, I still go to a lot of um, events for my industry where I'm one, you know, person of color there, or maybe there might be one other person. So that still needs to change from that instance. But I think what's really happened now that's really magnificent is that, you know, we have platforms like social media that has enabled mm -hmm. people to show themselves and also have that voice in this industry and be able to say that, okay, I count and my beauty counts and, you know, and really emphasize the point that beauty is, is um, very individual, you know, right. white is not the blueprint it, it, it is not it, it's not the blueprint right. it's not the default you know we mm. are all beautiful our beauty is different and that's absolutely fine but that has to be acknowledged by brands and i do think right. that brands are doing quite a lot um to ensure that everyone feels welcome you know i always say that a brand without a inclusivity strategy doesn't have a strategy that's you right. know you have to have that. And, you know, I do get a lot of the questions, you know, with people asking, do you think it's um, authentic and so on and so forth? And I'm like, you know what? They're a business. Yeah. They need to make money. That's what they're there for. So I think in many ways it might be slightly unfair to sort of say, oh, well, you know, you're just trying to make money because that's what most of them are trying to do regardless. Mm -hmm. that is what they, that's what their, their thing is. But essentially you, you do want someone who shares those values right. um, 
you and knows the importance of being inclusive and, and making every one, woman feel like her voice counts and her beauty counts and she is part of the beauty conversation. So I do think that that's, that is changing. I don't think okay. we're completely there. There is still, still absolutely a way to go right. on many levels, yes. Awesome, thank you. No, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Miss Miss Fumi Fajo, thank you so much, so yes. much for thank writing you. this book. You're My so question kind. for you okay. is, what advice do you have for someone who wants to write their own book and publish? Okay. What advice do you have for them and just where would they start? Okay, um, so funnily enough, I think with th this particular book, I, I didn't actually, I, I didn't know that I ever wanted to write a beauty book. So, and I think the reason why this book came about was more about a need. It was, it was like yes. an itch that you had to scratch. You know, yes. that. Yep. people have been asking me about writing a beauty book for years. And I've always said, no, I'm not interested in writing a beauty book. But this I wrote because I, I felt that there was a lot that needed to be said. And I, yeah. I felt that it had to be done. And it was, it was more about the message and me talking about the importance of um, equality, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I think that if you are writing a book, I think there's questions to ask yourself and, you know, ask yourself, first of all, do I want to read the book? You know, because if, you, if you're bored with what you're about to write, then that's probably right. fine. Do that I want to read the book? Why am I writing this? Why am I writing this book? What is the story? And this is this goes for fiction and nonfiction. Why is it important for me to tell the story? And why is it important that it comes from me and not from someone else? Um, right. And if you've got that clear, and you, and also making sure that you have an audience for it, you know, who you feel that would read it and would love it, and it and why why it deserves a space out there. You know, if someone else has done exactly the same thing, then, you know, right. then that's pointless. So I think those are the questions you ask initially. Once you've got all of that sorted out, um, you have to find an agent. You have to put your ideas down, almost break it down like a sort of deck, like you're kind of selling an idea mm -hmm. to yourself. And then you find yourself an agent. And, you know, you might find that you get in, in contact with lots of literary agents and you get a lot of rejections. That's fine. It's very, very individual. You might find one agent rejects you, but there's another one out there for you. So, you know, getting in contact with agents, I think your best bet is to look at writers that you love and writers that you feel are in the same kind of ilk as, you know, as you in terms of what you want to do and what you want to achieve and just go for those agents. And, in, you know, and then you go from there. And once you have an agent on board, then they negotiate sort of the deals with your publishers and so on. A lot of publishers won't deal direct with um, with authors. You need an agent in order to navigate mm -hmm. that. So that's, that's the biggest thing. Getting an agent is the biggest thing. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. So do we have any thoughts on a number two? Palette, please. please. Because, you know, please. I'm already ready for the next one. Yeah. Just to let you know. I get that question so much. And maybe, but <laughs> honestly, <laughs> this book nearly finished me. It nearly took me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe we could yeah. ask you this. As an advocate for diversity in the beauty industry, what is one change you would like to see implemented within brands now, especially because when you wrote the book, I guess the beauty industry was in one phase, mm -hmm. right? And there have been so many changes mm -hmm. thus far. Do you feel inspired to, to write on that and or not, but just to see what the changes have been and, and that inclusion diversity has become widespread topic of the conversation? You know, the thing is, <laughs> One of my biggest things is, you, you know, with brands, I, I think, yes, it's great that you have your 40 foundations. Yes, it's great you have this and that. Yes, it's great that now you're including some people of color within your campaigns. It, that is still a way to go with that, mind you. There's still a yes. lot of campaigns. I'm just like, mm, guys, come on, this is not good enough. You know, but where the real change happens is in the decision making arena 
And that is, has always been my biggest thing. Who is making these decisions? Who is, that, who is on the board? You know, who is the one deciding on what the campaign looks like? Who is the one deciding on what products should be made? You know, for the most part, it's still a sea of whites. It really, really is. So that is one thing that really needs to change. And that hasn't shifted at all. Yeah. since this book has been published that has not shifted you know there may be some organizations where you know there's a little bit of changes happening but not significant enough i do think that you know um brands with um black founders and you know women of color founders they need to also be given a space you know right. I know so many retailers, I, you know, I have horror stories, so many retailers who will refuse certain brands that are targeting, you know, this demographic. And, you know, so many brands who are, you know, founded and fronted by black founders don't have a voice. You know, I'm hoping that, you know, with everything that's happening at the moment, you know, there are a lot of brands who I've been speaking to and a lot of retailers I've been speaking to who have said that, they are making those changes and they are actively looking for brands um, founded by, you know, black women and so on, which I think is a great step. But we're in the very early days. And I think that we have to keep on, you know, talking about these things. Otherwise, what happens is that it just falls away from the agenda and everyone just yeah. thinks it's fine and we will literally just regress. So um, that is a huge, huge, huge thing because essentially that's where you know, that's where the power is, you know, who, you know, the people with power and authority, that's really w what needs to change. The products have changed yeah. right up here. It, it's still, it's still not quite right. And my question to you, and I, I, I don't expect you to have an answer is how mm -hmm. get that level to change? How can we start to integrate and and, and I guess get them to realize like you all have to change there too. The change can't just be in the number of products or, oh, we now have five models of color. Versus yeah, 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 exactly. Well, how could we integrate that change? They just need to hire people that don't look the same. <laughs> well, hire, yeah. different, hire different people with different backgrounds, hire people who look different. Because also yeah. the thing is that we are also bringing something very, very, um, lucrative and very important to the table you know a, a, um, a CEO of a company that um, develops um, hair care for mainly sort of you know white um, Caucasian women cannot tell me mm -hmm. what my hair you know right. but if you have other people at that level who you know who actually even have afro hair as well as you know, have the beauty experience and have worked yeah. in certain beauty places and so on and so forth, then they can inform that decision. I just, I think it's actually a very, it's a very simple, um, it's a very simple issue to resolve. Just hire, hire people of color and don't just hire people of color at the bottom of the ladder yeah. and leave them there. Hire them, promote them, but also hire them at high levels. I know so many incredible women who have so much to impart who could do so well in all of those positions but they're not necessarily given that opportunity so i think mm -hmm. th those doors need to be flung open and um they need to actively seek um black women women of color people of color in order to you know fill up those spaces definitely it's quite simple, but yeah, I mean, obviously really, it's not I mean, that I simple. People, I'm just like, it's not rocket science. It's, it really it's, isn't. It's straightforward. It really it's is. Yeah. So, I mean, in your role as a consultant, mm. how receptive do you feel that brands are? Like if you put up like, hey, you need to have more shades yeah. here. Like when you say that and give them that feedback, how often do you see them impart that change? Um, I have to say that a lot of of the brands have been quite receptive um yeah they've, they've been pretty receptive actually you know when i've i mean there was one particular brand that you know i this is quite a few years ago and i and i remember having a look at their range and just by chance i wasn't even trying to look for an issue and just by chance and i looked at their range and i thought oh my goodness this is so limited 
you know, mm -hmm. and it, it was embarrassingly so. This is the global, it was mm -hmm. so embarrassing. And I just felt so compelled to get in contact with them and say, guys, this, mm -hmm. you can't, this, it doesn't make any sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and at first, you know, when we first started the conversation, I think the conversation was for me to help them with making it more, more inclusive and so on. And then in the end, they were just like, actually, we want you to help to build the entire thing um, for all skin tones and so on. Um, which was amazing. Yeah, which was amazing for me because that's another thing as well. You know, I, you know, one of the things I always say is that as an editor, you know, I, I write across the board, you know, I can write about Caucasian hair and I can write about those treatments and I can write about what works on Caucasian skin and so on and so forth. And I want to be able to do that across the board and not just be um, pulled in just so we can talk about black skin because as an editor, I do everything across the board and I expect mm -hmm. my, my counterparts to be able to do the same. So it's that kind of thing that I, I want to see change. But you know, with the brands, I have to say they've been a lot of them have been pretty they've been pretty receptive actually because when they call you in as a consultant, for the most part, they they do want you to be honest. Um, okay. So you know, so I I am very honest. <laughs> Otherwise, what's the uh -huh. point? <laughs> right, right. It's no point to sugarcoat yeah. it. So exactly. How off or how long does it take you to write? How long did it take yeah. you to write this yeah. book? Oh. And what was your process like with selecting the products in here? Yeah. Like, was it like, oh my gosh, I would just die if this got discontinued? Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, with some of them, there were some products that I was like, I definitely, even before I'd sort of broken down all the sort of areas, there were some products that I thought, I know I'll definitely have this in there. Like, I don't know, Paula's Choice, this, that skin exfoliating liquid. I mean, it's insane, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So I knew I'd have that in there. I knew there'd be some classics in there, like your Mac Ruby Woo or whatever. Right. You know, I knew that I'd have Sunday Riley in there because I think it's a great brand. Um, you know, so there were some things that I kind of knew exactly that, yes, this will definitely go in there. But what I did do, I, I broke down all the sections and then I knew that I had to have at least, there would be at least 10 um, in each section. For something like the foundations, for instance, I struggled to keep it to 10. So I think there's probably 20. Um, because also people were just releasing new foundations and they were just yeah. getting better and, better and better. And even now, I mean, there's tons more that have been released since the book's been out that I, mm -hmm. you know, that I would include in there. So I kind of did it that way, but I tried absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. And wow. that was oh, that was a lot of work. Yeah, that was so much <laughs> And then there was a lot of stuff that just didn't make the cut. You know, for instance, you know, with sunscreens, I tried, I'd say between 60 and 70, and the final breakdown is 10. I've got 10 oh, in there. How do you even narrow 60 to 70 options? Like, I am not an option girl, so I'm, that, I'm like, you know, give me a four or five. And then I can narrow it down. It makes so sense how now. you go from like, um, like was there a rubric that you kind of had in your head or... Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I guess the thing is, as, a, as an editor, you get sent so much. And I yeah. wanted to be, I wanted to be fair. I wanted to be fair, yes, to the brands, but I also wanted to be fair to the reader. So I didn't want yeah. to just make an assumption and just put stuff in there because certain people are saying, oh, that's really great or whatever. No, I had to make sure that actually I was really featuring products that I could stand by and I really yeah. believed and if it turned out that you didn't like it because you won't necessarily like everything in there but if it turned out you didn't like it maybe that's a pre um, personal preference but I had to yeah. make sure that they hit to certain standards so that was really important so I mean from start to finish I probably it was written quite quickly I mean I think probably eight months you oh, know wow. yeah in terms of yeah from start to finish and that's that's pretty short. Some people take a few years, but you know, yeah. my editor was like, no, we want to get it in for such and such. I mean, they wanted a shorter deadline before and I was like, no, you're just trying to kill me off. <laughs> <That's not> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so it was about, it was about eight months and it was a very stressful, <laughs> especially 
<laughs> it was quite intense. Um, but yeah, I had such an incredible time. My agent was amazing. My editor was so phenomenal. Like moments where I'd be like, oh my goodness, why did I think this was a good idea? And then I'll see an email pop up from my editor going, you're going to be great. It's going to be fine. It's going to be wonderful. You know, and it was so nice. And she's a woman of color as well. And she was just so encouraging. And she was so excited about the book, which was really, really, it was just so wonderful. So yeah, yeah. so that was really helpful, definitely. And since you have tried so many products, I mean, um, what would you say at this point are the makeup trends or makeup products that you feel are gonna be timeless going forward? Ooh, you know, that's a difficult one. You know, we're in a time now where the idea of timelessness, I think that has evolved. It really, really has because we have when it comes to um products for instance you know so many products now are really pushing the boundaries in, in terms of technology so for instance you know there's a product that may have been incredible like five years ago and then new technology comes up and it's they're able to sort of tweak it to make it even better so i don't know the idea of a timeless product now is a strange concept to me because i think that things are always improving, things are always moving. I think we're in a really, excuse me, we're in a really exciting time for beauty where things are just constantly evolving and sort of changing. And I say that with the with the trends. I mean, yes, a red lip is always, um, is always timeless. <laughs> a red lip is always timeless. A winged eye is always timeless. Yeah in will always be in you know so there there are those aspects but i think that the timelessness can also be something that you attribute to something else as well you know that is just you you know beauty yeah. has become so democratic and so individual now um it's not about everyone trying to emulate a particular look it's yeah. um it's just forever kind of changing and and i love that i love the freedom of that i i really really do so um so yeah, th those are my takes on those things. But for this season, definitely we will still see a lot of red lips. We'll still see a lot of, there's a lot of winged eyes. Um, there's some sort of also dark lips, kind of quite sort of purpley plum sort of colors as well. But, you know, I say to people, you know, just go for it, you know, experiment, like whatever, you know, awesome. make your own classic. I love it. Okay, so I have a kind of a hard question because you have, it's not that hard, but just a little bit because you have so many amazing recommendations here. Mm -hmm. And so before I ask you the question, guys, if you all have questions that you would like to ask, let's go ahead and get them going because this is near, we're nearing the last question. So from each category, can you select one okay. product? <laughs> one. one product. Oh my goodness. Must pick. And I can give you the category by category so you okay. don't have to remember. And I've got okay. a pack here to remind myself. Okay. okay. So let's go. Okay, let's do it. All right. Let's do this. Here, give me one cleanser. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think. Sunday Riley ceramic slip. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hi. So excited okay. about that one. Okay. Okay. Exfoliators. Oh, that's easy. That's um, Paula's Choice um, Skin Perfecting Lotion. Okay. It's, it's, it's just incredible. Is that the uh, the BHA 2% Fumi? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love it's it. It's amazing. Yeah. Serums and moisturizers. Oh, that's a hard one. Okay, mm -hmm. let's have a look and see. Uh, <laughs> ooh, okay, serums and mo moisturizers. So Zelen's Brightening Serum is amazing. It's quite okay. pricey and it doesn't last very long. I mean, maybe I just mm -hmm. overdo it, but it's fabulous. It's so good. So yes, I'd say that. Although there's quite a few other ones in here that I quite love. Um, Tidal is good. I'm cheating a little bit now. So Tidal. <laughs> <laughs> you have really dry skin. Even if you okay. don't have dry skin, but if you have dehydrated skin, Tidal is amazing. It's okay. very water light, but it just really hydrates and plumps the skin and gives it a sort of really lovely glow um, without being too heavy. And you can use it if you're oily, 
or whether you're dry it's it's just fantastic it's a really good texture so that's a good one awesome. okay i'm gonna Next stick up. around a bit I'm okay gonna, I'm, I'm gonna throw you off a little and no, i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, foundations, which one? And you can even, if you have something that's updated that you haven't talked about in the book, yeah. you can share that too. Yeah, well, the NARS Natural Radiant found Longwear Foundation, I still think is phenomenal. I really yeah. do. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and also Becca. I think they I'm do it really today. Yeah. Becca. yeah, Becca. I think Becca do a really great foundation. So yeah, those two. two the full coverage the Becca push. one? Yeah. Yes, the, the, the Becca. yes, that one. Oh, oh yes. you want to get a little push to uh, finally purchase this. And this shade is um, New Caledonia. I have never had a more perfect match. Oh, nice. Ooh. I was That's like, fantastic. Oh, I'm so pleased because that's a tricky thing. You know, foundations are so tricky and they're so yeah. individual, aren't they? And also, yes. depending on what you're wearing on your skin beforehand, it can really impact the way your foundation mm -hmm. looks. So, you know, oh, there's definitely. so many factors that, you know, have an impact on it. So, I'm so pleased. That's fantastic. I'm so pleased to hear that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have two more categories that okay, I want to tell me. Ooh, ooh. Okay. Concealers and oh, concealer. You know what? I don't know if the Fenty one made it in here. I can't remember whether it launched, but I really liked that. It the did. Fenty. Yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah. I really yeah. like the Fenty one. And I also like the Pat McGrath concealer. Yeah. Yeah. I have like four shades. Yeah. I love that. It was that Alicia yeah. that made me go and get another shade. I was like, I need more so shades. Like yeah. So good. So good. So that's a really good one. And the last okay. category? Conditioners and treatments. Let's throw something in for the hair people. Ooh, let's, see, <laughs> let's see. Let's, see, let's, see. <laughs> let's throw it in for Kiki Sweat. Let's yep. see. <laughs> and treatments. So I really like, is this a conditioner? Maybe not. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Oh, I tell you what. So the, the um, Daviness, the new new hair mask is great. Oh, okay. It's really, really great. And then, see, the hair thing, I felt found the hair section tricky because, of course, there are tons of, of hair products and so on. But, I one, I wanted things that were available for everyone to get hold of. So accessibility really drove what's in here. But also, I wanted to include some of the brands that you never would have thought that they you know, create products for our hair types. So um, IGK, the yes. um, conditioner, that conditioner is the Hydrating Hot Girls um, conditioner is amazing. It's yes, really, really fantastic. Girl. Yeah, hot girl. I love yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you, you for that. You did such a good job. Yes. Yes. Oh my you God. did wonderfully. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm like, I'm do some more. I just want to hear some more recommendations. <laughs> yes. We do have a couple, yes, we do have a couple of good questions um, from the audience. So I thought this was a really good one. So do you feel that skincare is different from people of color versus people of non-color? Yes, absolutely. There are certain things that we deal with that it's not so much of an issue with, um, you know, Caucasian skin. And one of them, for instance, is um, hyperpigmentation. That is a huge thing in our community, you know, so we need products that kind of, you know, help with that. And then also, you know, there's sunscreen. You know, there's a lot of people who don't think that we need sunscreen. Right. Um, because we have more men in our skin, but we do. We need to wear sunscreen every single day because also it helps with our pigmentation. Yep. So, yeah. uh, but a lot of brands still don't create sunscreens with us in mind. Right. Um, yeah. It's actually so ashy, which is why then a lot of women don't want to wear it, um, and they really should because it's it's it helps to protect the skin. So yes, absolutely yes to that question. Awesome. Here's another good one. Have you worked with any brands known for excluding darker skin tones um, who want to change 
in that area? Um, okay, so if I come across a brand who is purposely excluded darker skin tones, I choose not to work with them. Ooh. But if I have a brand whereby I've pointed it out to them that look, you know, you need to do a little bit more here and um, include them. They've ge de generally been kind of open to that conversation. But, you know, this is my thing as well. You know, I go back to who's making the decisions right here on top. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to get to because I might be speaking to a global PR director who's, you know, who's like, yeah, absolutely, I think we should do this and so on. But then, you know, if we're talking about a huge company, we're talking about layers of people right. that information needs to get to in order for yeah. that to change. So it's it's complicated. But yes, you know, I have worked with um, brands that I think they're not doing enough. And I've pointed that out to them and spoken to them about it. And they have been you know, for the most part, they've been, certainly in this day and age, they've been much more receptive. Back in the day, I would have tons of excuses as to why they don't have the darker skin mm -hmm. or, and that sort of thing. There'd be just excuses and nothing ever changes. But now I'm beginning to see those comments and those conversations are being taken on board. Yeah. That's good. Um, here's another one. What is a good non-transferring oh. foundation? <laughs> Okay, so I would say it depends on what shade you're talking about because, mm -hmm. listen, you know, there's a lot of brands that can say it doesn't transfer at all. I mean, Estee Lauder's um, foundation is one that is, you know, that's yeah. one of the key points about it, that it doesn't transfer. But really, do we have a foundation that doesn't transfer at all? There isn't one. No. There, you know, you can say that it doesn't transfer as much, but right. have one that doesn't transfer at all. Yeah. I don't know. No. Especially with the climate and yeah, oil mask wearing. It's yeah. going to yeah. manipulate the finish. Yeah. I mean, I would say that it's better than not to go for something that's too oily because, you sure. know, then that will just get everywhere. You know, I remember back in the day, you know, having foundations where you're just like, oh, my God, it's in my spoon. It's here. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> Nightmare. Like, how did it get here? You know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, but thankfully, a lot of the a lot of the formulations have become much more sophisticated, so you don't get that as much. Um, but yeah, I don't think you can find one that doesn't transfer at all, especially for us, you know, it has to have some sort of pigment in it. So, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> Beauty in her boots wants to know if you've tried the Alma Beauty Foundation oh. and, uh, yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is I know Sharon very, very well because I worked with her on the brand pre-launch. So we worked mm. on, yes. So, um, you know, she obviously did all the, you know, worked with the foundations, but I was, I, um, I was a consultant on the brand um, for, for some time wow. before it, it launched. And, um, and I'm so pleased, Sharon would be so, so thrilled to hear that. She worked incredibly hard. We tested a lot and yeah. tested it in lots of different lights and tested it over different points and so on and so forth to make sure that formula was right. Um, so yes. Good. I'm I love glad. That. I'm yes. Glad. And I love how each foundation's kingdom has a yeah. different set of ingredients, like ever yes. so slightly. Yeah. To, yes. Address different skincare concerns. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. And I think more and more, I think makeup is going to have to move that way. We don't yeah. just want color or, you know, pigment. You want something that's actually helping your skin and doing something with your skin, yeah. whether it's hydrating it, whether it's dealing with pigmentation, whether it's dealing with dryness or dehydration, I think that's going to have to become more and more important because we're just much more conscious about right. what we put on our skin. So, exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's another good one. As consumers, when should we stop buying from brands that exclude us? And I think this is a really good question because there is some debate now, you know, where brands have, if I could say, um, offended people mm -hmm. of color with some of their mm -hmm. marketing. Um, they've apologized, but then it's like, do we yeah, yeah. give them another chance? What, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And when should we actually say, you know what, enough is enough? Mm -hmm. We should really stop giving I, our I think, 
I think it's um, it's one. It's very individual. You know, okay. I would never sort of um, cancel someone because they've decided to shop with a particular brand or whatever that I wouldn't shop from. However, I do think that it is important to to ensure that brands know that if they want your money, then they have to respect you. You know, there's certain places that I refuse now, there's certain brands, and I'm not just necessarily talking about, um, you know, um, beauty brands, but certain brands whereby if they haven't treated me right, and if I know that they're not treating, you know, my community right, I'm not going to give them my money. So I think that that's something that that's one of those things that one has to kind of decide for themselves. I will say this, however, with certain brands that have, you know, a wide, um, a wide range of, you know, colors for dark skin tones and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. I'm always asked that, do we buy that brand or do we buy um, black owned brands? And I think, you know, we use lots of makeup. We don't have to necessarily just stick to one brand, but I right. will say, that, you know, if you have, those brands that are not specifically you know black owned or whatever if we don't shop from those brands if we don't buy those products that they are creating for us they will stop making those products because yeah. they will they will say it doesn't sell so we yeah. need to be conscious of that as well because then we just start out that whole cycle if it doesn't sell they'll stop making it and then yeah. we'll that they're not making it, you know, that sort of thing. So I just yeah. think you need to be aware of those um, situations. But if there's a brand that is purposely kind of excluding us, then I think by by all means, you know, you can decide where you put your money. It's your choice, absolutely. And that's a great answer. Yeah. I feel like, especially in this space, we struggle a lot with deciding what to review and what not to review because like you we try a lot of products too to try to you know give people you know an in-depth look a lot you know make them not be able to spend their money let us spend our money and we'll tell you whether or not we like it and so nowadays because of cancel culture i think that it's really hard to navigate because so often we buy things and then people are upset with them case in point yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah. about this bronzer a lot of people have been upset with certain things that they've mm -hmm. done in the past while they've made, you know, moves to, yeah. you know, do a little bit better yeah. and be more inclusive. I still think that a lot of people won't give another mm -hmm. chance and then they really shame us mm -hmm. for wanting to be mm -hmm. in this space mm -hmm. and be patient and mm -hmm. give these brands another chance. Yes, and so yeah. Yeah. I think that is no, important. Yeah, I think it's important. And I, I really don't believe in, in cancel culture. I, I, I really feel strongly about that. I think it's about having a dialogue and having a conversation about these things. And there are lots of different brands that, you know, I've had conversations with and I know internally what they are doing in order to, you know, ensure that certain things don't happen anymore and so on and so forth. And if I can see that those brands are doing that, there's no reason why, um, I won't continue to whether support them or write about them. Because also I kind of think that it's important for us to do our jobs as well. Yeah. You know, our job my job, for instance, is to give people choice. But mm. I need to articulate um yeah. breakdown of what that information the information that you need in order to make a choice. But it's not always my job to judge in many yeah. ways. I'm I feel really strongly about something and I feel something is whether immoral or completely unethical, but it's my job to give you choice and then you make that choice. But I can give you enough information to make an informed decision. So, but I, I definitely don't believe in cancel culture and I think it's a real problem um, right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's gone out of hand, it's crazy. Especially wow. within the luxury beauty space because yeah. that's often an area that we have been misrepresented for a long time. Mm -hmm. And now we have the opportunity to show these products yes. where people really feel strongly in their hearts with certain mm -hmm. brands. Mm -hmm. But like right. to your point, if we don't show that we mm -hmm. want more from these brands with our yeah. dollars, exactly. then, gonna, then nothing's going to happen. Five exactly. shades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. We yeah, have to exactly. be the ones that propel that change. That's the only way. And it is difficult because you kind of want to hold them, you know, to account for the mistakes they've made in the past. But at right. the same time, you know, how do we move forward? I think it's important for us to think about how we move forward. And we can't mm -hmm. keep holding on to the past if we want to move forward. We have to have that dialogue. We have to have that conversation. Absolutely. 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 Like any relationship. 
any relationship yeah. that you have, Absolutely. you have to communicate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You yeah. cannot be mad silently. Like just say something. And mm. then if you give them a chance after communicating exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. And then if they don't want to change and so on, and then you can be like, okay, I'm not spending my money there or I'm exactly. not supporting you or I'm not, you know. So yeah, absolutely. I'm going to do that another one. A setting spray recommendation for oily skinned ladies. Oh, so I quite like, I'm still, setting sprays are still a tricky one, I think. Um, Urban Decay's old schooler, still pretty oh good. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. still pretty good. Um, there's one more I'm thinking of actually that's quite good. Um, it escapes me now, but there is one other one. But setting sprays, quite a lot of them for some reason don't really, they don't really work as well as they should, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like the I do like the Urban Decay one. I think that's pretty good. But I would say a translucent powder is is probably more efficient in many ways at this point. And I think it's also a case of watching what you put underneath your foundation in order to ensure that everything doesn't get too oily. Right. Any recommendations for a translucent setting powder? I know oh. you mentioned the Kat Von D or the KVD now. Yes, KVD. Yeah, KVD is good. KVD is really good. Um, but you have to make sure you don't put it like absolutely everywhere with most setting powders it's not absolutely everywhere otherwise you then start to look a little bit flat so you have to be quite right. sort of intentional about where you put it um i quite i do like the um the setting powder actually from um pat mcgrath i think it's a good one and um and i think laura mercier's is is good because it's translucent i think that's a that's a good one too but i think all the things that you put underneath your skin will also determine how everything else um, behaves. There's another question. Um, someone asks, what is your favorite lipstick formula? I'm gonna try to find it so I can give credit to who asked it. But yes, what is your favorite lipstick formula? As in a brand or whether it's liquid or whatever it's... They didn't specify if it was okay. a brand, but just like, I, I guess... Mean, I love I love a liquid lipstick. I'm kind of obsessed with because I just think they're just easier to kind of move around. I yeah, so I I tend to go for a liquid lipstick. I love um I mean at the moment I'm trying out this this is a Bobbi Brown it's one of their sort of new ranges I think. It's a Bobbi Brown um liquid lip. But I love um Nars. I think the um Power Mats. I love a matte. So the Power Mat for me I think they're great because also you know you get a lot of you get a lot of um, mattes that make your lips feel really sort of tight and crumbly. Yeah. So I quite, yeah, I, I do quite like that. Um, I think Stiller also have quite a good mattes as well, and they're very comfortable on your lips. But yeah, I tend to go for liquid lips more than a sort of bullet. And I never have, I never use a sort of shiny, glossy lipstick, very rarely. If I want a gloss, I'll do a gloss, but I won't use a lipstick that's a gloss. Gotcha. Mm. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Just because I'm curious. Mm -hmm. What type of music do you like to listen to? <laughs> well, at the moment, I'm obsessing over Beyonce. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Come on now. Come on. I mean, I'm hearing <laughs> it in my it. sleep. <laughs> I mean, what does she not do? To I mean, she's like just everything. So, she yeah. Is. So that's what I'm listening to, uh, loving at the moment. But I listen to a mix of different things. You know, I love, I still love a lot of old jazz. I love Nina Simone um, yeah. and Ella Fitzgerald. You know, oh, I still yeah. sometimes go a little bit old school. Um, I love gospel. I love Fred Hammond. I think he's amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I love some of Drake, but I love, you know, I kind of, I kind of mix it up really. I think it really sort of, um, yeah, it kind of just depends on my mood, really. I love classical music um, because I just find it very calming. Very calming, yes. yeah. yeah. Incredibly yeah. calming. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know, there's an orchestra called um, Chineke and it's an all black or, you know, uh, or people, oh. black, people of color orchestra. And I was watching them just the other day and it's just so wonderful to see because normally those are very, very, very white spaces. Yeah. So that just 
I mean, I my heart was fit to burst. I mean, it was pretty amazing. So yeah, I listened to a whole range of um, different type of music. And I love, of course, I love Afrobeats because yeah. that's cool. Um, I'm obsessed with Afrobeats. So yeah, that's I it. it. Um, <laughs> well, but I know that you had a very tight schedule, so we don't want to hold you too much longer. Once again, yeah. we can't thank right. you enough for just literally squeezing us in and taking no, this time with us. No, we have, we have yes, cherished this so much. Thank you so much for joining yes, us thank today. You. Thank you so, so much. I've loved talking to you all. Thank you so much. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Even though you said right now you don't have aspirations for a palette number two, I'm just saying, <laughs> maybe consider it. And then when you do, we would love to have you come back on, even if it's not a, you know, a, a new book, but any new venture that you're going to have in the future, let us know. We would love to bring you back on and share that with everyone because we amazing. will continue to support you. I'm so thank glad that you. I have found you. And yes, so, amazing. Uh, yeah. Thank you Whatever so endeavors much. you have in mind, we will be yes. there to promote. Yes, they are. Absolutely. Yes. Thank yes. you so much, guys. That means so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've loved every minute of this. No thank problem you. at all. And just to let everyone know, we we have linked her book down below, so you can shop that. It is available. Let's sell it out because we have to support our own. Um, and yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank she you. She sits proudly back here. Yes, yes, way. yes. Thank you all so much. We're so glad to have you here and definitely be on the lookout for our next episode and have an amazing day, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.